watching Over the Edge from Event Horizon with John Michael Godier. And I am back with Professor Abraham Loeb of Harvard University. We were talking, we touched on it earlier. So if you were looking at an exoplanet atmosphere, speaking of ultraviolet radiation, and you saw something like CFCs, what would that indicate? Well, that would indicate that there is industrial pollution there, that uh, there is an advanced civilization, uh, probably not uh, sufficiently intelligent to suppress the CFCs. Um, so it's possible that the civilization is not in existence anymore, that it changed its uh, climate to a, a point, a boiling point where they, they, they are not there anymore. Um, but the... Um, but the, the pollutants could outlive the civilization. They could live for thousands of years, uh, they survive these molecules. Um, and um, that would be an, a very exciting discovery in the sense that we would find evidence for, for a, a technosignature. Uh, and um, nature by itself uh, does not produce CFCs. Um, it's a very complex uh, uh, set of molecules. Um, and um, therefore, you know, we we um, once we find evidence for it, it will be be, be clear that we're talking about an artificially produced uh, molecule. So, if a civilization, say, um, not CFCs per se, of course, but say they were terraforming a planet, changing the gases in its atmosphere, which essentially we're doing, could that be a techno signature? Would there be a, some weird juxtaposition of gases that would indicate terraforming is going on? Yes, yes. So in fact, um, uh, CFCs could be useful if you want to warm up the planet that is otherwise too cold. And as you say, indeed, a, a civilization might have an, a project to uh, warm up an otherwise too cold planet so they can inhabit it. And uh, we would see that the planet is warmer than it's supposed to be we might detect uh, these pollutants that make it, make it uh, get warmer and uh, having both of them, uh, both of these pieces of evidence um, would convince us that there is some, something artificial about, about this planet. So you could, you could detect it that way or say they were, for whatever reason, uh, migrating planets using gravitational objects to migrate planets. If you watched very long term, would that be a techno signature? In other words, planets moving in, in an odd way. Yes, that could be. And um, not just planets, but potentially even stars, if depending on the Kardashev level of civilization. Um, yes, if you see motions that are peculiar. Uh, and by now, for example, um, there are, you know, very advanced uh, instruments that detect uh, motion of stars. For example, the Gaia mission uh, is documenting, uh, is doing astrometry of stars, uh, detecting their position very precisely. And so, in pr principle, we could look for um, peculiar motions that cannot be explained by natural means. Um, and that would be a techno signature. Um, there are all kinds of other techno signatures that we can imagine. The, the, the problem is um, whether you know whether we have the correct ideas and and whether anyone is doing what we we are, we are thinking about. Uh, I, my view about the SETI is that we shouldn't have a prejudice. That, um, we shouldn't assume that we know the answer in advance. We should search for whatever our instruments allow us to search through. And whenever we see any anomaly, we, we should examine it in, in, in more detail. Uh, the same was true for Tabby's star. And there was this star that was dimming in a way that is very peculiar. And after more data was collected, it, it became uh, clear that it's probably dust that is obscuring our view of the star. And it may be some some debris disk around it, um, and um, uh, that that is progress in science. So even if we initially think about uh, some unusual explanations, even if it turns out that you can explain the phenomena in a more natural way by uh, some natural origin, uh, then we learn something new. Uh, science is a learning experience. Um, the, the the most 
uh, appealing aspect of science for me is that I can retain uh, my youth and innocence the way I was as a kid. You know, I can. I don't need to pretend that I know something. Uh, I can make mistakes and I can ask questions and and nobody would laugh at, at those questions because that's uh, you know it's a learning experience. We we're trying to figure out what nature is all about. The problem arises when some scientists are get too attached to their egos and um, pretend either that they know more than they actually know or become extremely conservative in order to protect uh, reputation. And, and they, at that point, they do not take any risks. They don't ask new questions. They're not willing to be wrong. And that's where innovation dies. And unfortunately, it's a very common phenomenon for, um, for scientists as they become senior to, to be less, to take fewer risks and to be less innovative. But um, I'm trying to demonstrate that there is an alternative path and that uh, you can um, retain your curiosity about the universe even late in your career. Do you take flack for that? Um, I, frankly, I don't really care about it. Um, I, every now and then, you know, when I was younger, obviously, uh, would uh, be criticized more often. But uh, the strange thing about my situation right now is, uh, uh, I'm uh, at a powerful leadership uh, position. I'm chair of a department. Uh, at Harvard. Uh, I'm um, a director of two centers at Harvard. Uh, one is the Black Hole Initiative, the, the only center in the world that, that work that focuses on black holes, that brings together uh, physicists, mathematicians, astronomers, and philosophers, uh, historians of science. Um, and, and I'm also the director of the Institute for Theory and Computation uh, at Harvard. Uh, and I'm chairing the Starshot Initiative, and I'm chairing um, the board on physics and astronomy of the national academies, uh, and I'm uh, we're still engaged mostly in research right now. Um, uh, uh, earlier this year, I, I uh, finished my 600th uh, paper, and um, so I'm very active at, at research with my students and postdocs. And um, the point is that I'm doing mainstream research uh, much of the time. But at the same time, I don't put boundaries as to uh, risky uh, directions. That because the point is that if you if you want to discover something new, if you want to learn something really fundamental, you have to take risks. There is no way around it, and that that's well understood in the business world, uh, in venture capitalism. Um, it's uh, well understood that you have to put money in risky propositions in order to get great benefits uh, from one out of a hundred project. Uh, and it's also under, it was also understood in, in companies like Bell Labs that uh, uh, recruited uh, uh, creative individuals, uh, some of the best physicists, um, about half a century ago in a single corridor and uh, allowed them to take risks. Uh, and they came up with um, the invention of radio astronomy, uh, Jansky was there, uh, with uh, the technology of lasers, uh, with uh, communica space communication, satellites, uh, with the CCD. M many major discoveries came from Bell Labs. Um, and it's clear in my mind that uh, a creating a culture that uh, tolerates mistakes, that tolerates uh, risks, uh, is essential, especially for science, more so than in the business world. Uh, and it's unfortunate uh, that it's not a well-accepted uh, dogma, but but it works well uh, in my environment. And and uh, the fact that they have these uh, other uh, roles, uh, you know, it, it provides me with the freedom uh, to, to navigate in the direction that I, I think is right uh, and not to get too much flack for it. Don't ever stop writing papers. Uh, I very much enjoy those papers. That was a bit of material that went over the edge. A bonus clip from a full episode of Event Horizon. New episodes every Thursday. So do be sure to hit subscribe. The full episode should be on your screen right about now. <laughs> <laughs>